five minutes after 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Our next guest has quite quite a track record. Oh, my gosh. Let me just read this to you real quickly. Um, John Hart is on the phone. He's got a new book, and the copy they sent to us is the audio book, which is kind of cool. Uh, it's called The Hush. John is the only writer in history to win consecutive Edgar Awards for Best Novel, from New York Times bestselling author John Hart returns to the world of his most beloved novel, The Last Child, and uh, the new one is called The Hush, and uh, he's on the phone, and we have a very short interview. Usually when they're successful, Robin, that's when we have short interviews. I right? know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John Hart uh, is a former defense attorney and stockbroker, and uh, as I just mentioned, an Edgar Award-winning New York Times bestselling author. Good morning, John. How are you? Hey, Larry, Robin. Good morning to you guys. I'm doing great. Where are you? Where do you... Where are you do you live, or where are you calling from? Well, I live in Virginia. I'm in Charlottesville. Uh, that's my hometown. I am on the road touring the new book for five weeks. So at the moment, I'm in Greensboro, North Carolina. Wow. Did you ever see this coming? I mean, did you know you had this in you, or were you surprised? I, I was surprised at how well the whole thing has worked. Um, I call it my 15-year overnight success story, and I, I say it that way because I tried 15 years to get published. I, I wrote many books that yeah. failed and never represented. And uh, when the first one got published, it was actually the third I'd written, and it took off like a scalded cat. And since then, I've been constantly surprised. Your protagonist is named Johnny. Uh, it's unusual for an author to name his protagonist his same, and his friend is named Jack, which is a, a nickname for John. Is there a reason for that? Yeah. Absolutely. Man, you, you're the first person that's ever caught that. Um, <laughs> I mean, seriously, I, I've talked about this in public, but no one has ever caught it on their own. That's really remarkable. Uh, Johnny and Jack are both nicknames for John. That was intentional. Um, when I wrote The Last Child, which came out in 2009, I was in my early 40s, and this is an adult-themed thriller driven by these two 13-year-old boys who are best friends and dealing with these horrible circumstances. Uh, that I won't get into uh, unless you specifically ask me. But in order to make them credible enough to drive this novel, I needed to make them very real uh, to the readers. And the best way to do that uh, was to go deep in my own memories of how it felt to be 13, to try to find that sense of magic and wonder um, coupled with the kind of uh, aloneness and fear that one might feel when their oh, world wow. turned upside down. Is it dangerous? So it was a very personal. Okay, and that's what I, and the, the fact that it was personal. I was just wondering if that was dangerous, not in the in the truest definition of danger, but I mean, is it is it risky to dig into your own self in order to build a character for fear that it might become yourself or or look too much like yourself? Yeah, there there is a nakedness there uh, that I, I willingly undertook, even though I did feel a little bit exposed. Um, you know, Johnny is the good kid. He's clear eyed, selfless, courageous. Jack steals his daddy's liquor, slicks his hair, smokes cigarettes, <laughs> um, gets into trouble in school. That's you know, the other. Both of those boys. <laughs> that was you in, at when you were 16, 17, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I was, I was hoping that I had more of Johnny and less of Jack, but I, I probably had both uh, in equal measure. That's mm -hmm. funny. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this to be an audio book, I mean, I imagine that you have uh, heard emotions uh, that you have only felt. That way the reader... Uh, let's see, uh, Jeremy Bob can sense the emotion that you have in your writing, and he does a great job portraying it audibly. Yeah, he, yeah. oh boy, he's great. He, he's really good. So in The Hush, we've got these same boys. They're now young men 10 years later, and it's a very different kind of story. And I, of course, any book I write, I, I hear the voices, I see the characters very clearly in my own mind. And then when a narrator, whom I've never met uh, and yet has this skill set, is able to bring them all to life, um, you know, different voices, intonations, cadences, perhaps, than I had in my mind when I wrote it. It's kind of a shocking, jarring experience um, until I settle into it, and then it's a lot of fun. Have you, uh, the, the, reader, it, the book's only been out, like, less than a week. Do the readers uh, who are familiar with your earlier work, um, are, are they, like, this continues some of their earlier work, right? I mean, this is a continuation? Sort of. Um, I wrote it uh, to be a standalone because, um, you know, the, the world is large and not everyone on the planet has read The Last Child. Right. So I wanted the bus to be accessible to everyone. Um, those who have read The Last Child or who choose to read it now will have, I think, a slightly richer reading experience yeah, yeah. for having done so, but it's, it's definitely not required. And, and there's a bit of a challenge in writing a sequel that does not require knowing the first one, but I, I think I pulled it off. The one, th one thing I wanted to tell you real quickly that's kind of a, an aside 
type of a, an observation is that Rob and I interview authors all the time, and our listeners are uh, so there's a certain segment of them that are blind. And quite often they will ask us if there's an audio version of a book because they're listening to the radio, getting a gist of a story and would love to read it. And either it's not available in Braille or it's not available in audio. And uh, the fact that you not only have one, but sent one to us, <laughs> that's awesome. So we, we're going to give it away in just a little bit. If somebody out there is already intrigued, you can uh, call and let us know you'd like it. Um, so, so is that, I mean, is that, you, you, I mean, you have a great speaking voice. Is there any reason why you didn't narrate it yourself? Uh, yeah, look, um, first of all, I, I'd probably butcher it uh, for all, all the wrong reasons. Um, there is a skill set that these actors bring to the table that I lack. And if you notice a, uh, an audio book that you really get into, it's because he finds ways to deliver the different characters and distinctive voices. Um, and that takes a skill set that I just lack. I could read the book, and, and mm-hmm. I would, I'm sure I wouldn't mangle too many of the words, but delivering that uh, actor, that actor's voice, that experience is beyond me. And your uh, books are uh, accepted by different cultures. I mean, you have your books translated in, into 30 different languages, and you really relate to everything, to everybody. Yeah, and, and it's funny to see where I become uh, a big bestseller and, and where, you know, I'm, I'm perhaps a little more in the shadows. And it, uh, it is cultural, I suspect. But um, the, um, the key is just to tell stories built around universal themes. Um, you know, some countries have an abiding fascination with the American South. It's amazing. Uh, in Denmark, for instance, I understand that's a kind of a national obsession, if that's not too strong a word. Uh, so I have a leg up there. And then in, in other places, it really does come down to me doing the best job I can the French, for instance, are notoriously fickle about publishing American novelists, uh, and I've been very fortunate to gain some success there. You just, you never know. I mean, I, I can't possibly understand all the cultures that yeah, decided really, to publish. Really. Uh, gosh, it's, it's great to have you on. Um, John Hart is our guest. The book is The Hush. I did find it on Amazon, um, and he did send us an audio copy. These are 12 CDs. Um, thirty nine ninety nine is what it sells for in the store. I'd like to give this one away. Call me if you'd like it. You can have it. The rest of us have to go buy it. Um, do you, besides Amazon, do you have a recommended website? Yeah, you can find out most anything you want about me at johnhartfiction.com. That's H-A-R-T, johnhartfiction.com. And there are links to social media if you like Facebook or Twitter, that sort of thing. All right. Uh, well, thank you for being on the air with us. Like I mentioned in the beginning, it's an honor to have you. You're so successful. And keep up the good work. If you're ever in Florida, do, do one of these in the studio with us. Well, uh, I'll be down there uh, for five days touring uh, a bit later this month, uh, but I'm not sure exactly what my schedule is. But I'll, I'll mention that to my publicist, and thank you for the, uh, for the well, time on and, the air. And if you can't come in here, just let us know. We'll, we'll promote the book signings if you're doing any of them. Well, that, Matt, that's very kind of you. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we will be right back. Ocala Business Leaders Incorporated is a group of independent local firms providing a wide range of quality goods and services. Each firm strives to maintain the highest level of professional integrity and 100% customer satisfaction. When you're looking for goods and services, call a member of the Ocala Business Leaders and we are confident you will be pleased with the results. If you are interested in becoming a member of the Ocala Business Leaders, join us at the Ocala Elks Lodge, 25th Avenue in Ocala, any Wednesday at 7 a.m. and enjoy a breakfast on us. For more information, check OcalaBusinessLeaders.com. If you don't believe this is a super early azalea season, then open your eyes and look around town. They're everywhere. They're in gorgeous bloom right now. Now all you have to do is get down to Bob Wine's Camellia Gardens for their fabulous truckload azalea sale. Here's a super buy. A special selection of variegated dogwood azaleas, number one size, regular $7.99 for just $2.99. Yes, I said just $2.99. Of course, Bob's still got plenty of those ever-blooming red ruffles. They're still just $3.99. And how about veggies. Bob's got them in a big new veggie section right out front. They're still just $3.49 for the jumbo four pack. Buy one, get one at half price on the trees, so don't miss that sale right now. All going on now during the Camellia Show Spectacular daily till 4, Saturdays till 2 at Bob Wines Camellia Gardens, Southeast 38th Street, Ocala, homegrown, locally owned since 1952. 
Here are today's headlines from the source WOCA. Florida's Healthy Start program is facing huge budget cuts from the state Senate. The program helps thousands of high-risk mothers and babies in Florida. The state Senate has proposed $19 million in cuts. Officials with Healthy Start say that is 29% of its budget. Healthy Start helps families ensure at-risk babies have the best chance at a healthy start in life. They work with opioid addictions, infant care, safe sleep, child development, pregnancy care, and more. The cuts are so substantial that advocates for the program say it could disappear in some areas of the state. Since Healthy Start came to fruition in 1991, infant mortality in the state of Florida has been down 35%. The school safety package drafted by Republican leaders in the state legislature after the massacre in Parkland, Florida, is up for a floor vote today in the Florida Senate. Senators spent all day Saturday debating and defeating amendments offered by the Democrats. Senator Jose Rodriguez wanted to remove the school marshal program that would allow some teachers to have guns in class. We should not arm teachers. I do not think that the response to gun violence in our schools is to put more guns in our schools. Senate Republicans also shot down amendments to ban assault rifles and high capacity magazines, but they did agree that school marshals should have diversity training so they know how to deal with students of different races and cultures. Rick Lag, Tallahassee. 34 counties along the I-10 corridor are getting together to promote the region from Pensacola to Jacksonville as a great place for manufacturing and logistics, in other words, factories and warehouses. But the biggest county between those two cities is Leon County and is not part of that campaign. Kim Wilms with the North Florida Corridor Group says they did not snub Tallahassee. Some of the counties that are uh, not represented in our regional entities are um, on their own uh, with their marketing efforts and initiatives focused on areas that, that may not necessarily be aligned with what we are doing right now. The group of four economic development councils says the I-10 region has good ports and highway connections, plus plenty of open land for facilities. It also has a young workforce, including many veterans and few union workers. Senator Marco Rubio spelled out his plan released this week for curbing gun violence during a stop in Tampa on Saturday. Rubio said his plan has several components, including strengthening background checks when buying a weapon and getting better safety plans in schools. But the plan's main goal, Rubio said, is to get guns out of the hands of people who pose a threat. Rubio said he supports the Second Amendment and stressed that his plan won't take away people's rights to have a gun. He said, quote, the Second Amendment is like any other constitutional right. It's not unlimited. You can't libel or slander people under the First Amendment. And I don't know of anyone who disagrees that dangerous and violent people should not have access to their guns, he said. He went on to say, we shouldn't punish law-abiding citizens and their right to protect themselves, unquote. Rubio also plans to present a new bill with a group of bipartisan senators this week that would prosecute people who don't pass background checks and still try to purchase a weapon. Shark migration season has begun in southeast Florida. In the largest migration in U.S. coastal waters, black tip sharks are headed south in the thousands for their annual migration off Florida's southeast coast. Stephen Kajiora, a Ph.D. and an internationally renowned shark expert and researcher at Florida Atlantic University, has been observing and tracking the sharks for eight consecutive years. Using a boat, plane, acoustic monitoring devices, and drones, he can report their whereabouts in real time. Time. Odds are that anyone in the water will be within a 60-foot radius of one of those sharks. However, monitoring the migration patterns of black tip sharks is not just about public safety, it's also about ocean health. Kajiora said these sharks sweep through the waters and spring clean as they weed out weak and sick fish species, helping to preserve coral reefs and seagrasses. In prior years, researchers have reported as many as 15,000 sharks on any given day, but aerial video shows dramatically fewer fewer black tip sharks. Florida Attorney General Pam Bondi has been spending a lot of time in Washington talking about school shootings and the opioid crisis, which costs 125 lives a day nationwide. It has to be a multifaceted approach. That's what we're all saying. It, we have to crack down on enforcement. This black market fentanyl is coming in through China, the heroin through Mexico. We have to support our board, protect our borders from this coming in. Bondi says we need to do a better job of educating students about the dangers of drugs. 
Daytona Beach police say a naked woman fatally shot a man outside an apartment building and then threatened neighbors. A Daytona Beach police report says 39-year-old Latasha Reeves was arrested Saturday on suspicion of murder after detectives found 47-year-old Patrick Robinson's body outside her apartment. Witnesses told police that Reeves was about five feet from Robinson when she shot him in the chest after an argument. Daytona Beach Police Chief Craig Capri told the Daytona Beach News Journal that Reeves threatened neighbors after the shooting and barricaded herself in the apartment. According to the report, Reeves refused to put on clothing for several hours after her arrest and that she was on some substance affecting her actions and mood. She was eventually arrested after surrendering. Flights going off the boards at airports around Florida as a late winter storm brings harsh weather to the Northeast. That's happening as those same airports get busy for spring break. Emily Nips is with Tampa International Airport. Use the cell phone waiting lot. It has restrooms and free Wi-Fi. And also we have uh, this new remote bag check center in our rental car center. So if you're using a rental car center or if you're using our economy parking garage, you can stop and check your bags and pick up your boarding passes there. Um, that way you don't have to drag your bags through the airport. Nips is expecting a 7% increase in passenger traffic at her airport compared with a year ago. And there used to be wild flamingos in Florida until people hunted them first for food and later for their feathers. The conventional wisdom and official state position was that the flamingos never came back and never were native species. But researchers want that opinion changed, combining historical data with increasing reports of flamingo sightings from birders. Researchers have led to a different conclusion and they published that conclusion in the research journal.